Okay, well. So um, I'd like to introduce, this is Dr. Wei Zhang, and um, she is the Director for the Anxiety and Traumatic Stress Program in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Duke University Medical Center. She earned her PhD degree in Anatomy and Neuroscience from the Indiana University School of Medicine, and then she completed a residency in psychiatry here at Duke, and, as well as the Duke GSK Clinical Psychopharmacology Fellowship. Dr. Zong's primary research interests include the psychopathology and therapeutics of anxiety disorders, um, in particular post-traumatic stress disorder and generalized anxiety disorder. She's authored or co-authored articles appearing in journals um, such as the American Journal of Psychiatry, Neuropsychopharmacology, Nature Medicine, and Psychopharmacology. Um, she's also served on the executive committee for the International Psychopharmacology Algorithm Project, which published psychopharmacological psychopharmaco algorithms for post-traumatic stress disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, and other psychiatric disorders. So let's welcome Dr. Zong. Alrighty, I hope you guys can hear me now. Thank you so much, Maureen, and for inviting me. And it's glad to be here. And uh, it was a very nice walk and very relaxing. And uh, serves good to, um, you know, kind of relax and combat anxiety a little bit from walking from Duke South to here. <laughs> so, um, so the topic today is about anxiety disorders, and I want to focus on the recognition of symptoms that, uh, in terms of establishing diagnosis, uh, give you some idea of the disease burden and impact of the illness, as well as uh, touching on some uh, basic rules for treatment and uh, first-line uh, choices, medication choices. So um, anxiety really is a built-in part of human emotion in face of stress, okay? It usually happens in situations that are perceived as uncontrollable or unavoidable. Um, like all human emotion, it serves the purpose to kind of tell the body something is happening in your environment and a prompt action to cope as well. So evolutionally, anxiety has served very many good purposes. However, like everything else in life, too many good things can be harmful as well. So anxiety becomes an anxiety disorder when it crosses certain threshold. And in, uh, in psychiatry, we define those threshold as functional impairment or distress. Okay, a lot of people come in and say, well, anxiety, we all experience anxiety, okay? When do you need the treatment and when do you call a disorder? According to DSM-4, which is Diagnostic and the Statistical Manual, um, of, which is uh, ICD really equivalent in psychiatry as in medicine, you know? Are you guys familiar with the ICD, the International Classification for Disease? Yes. So according to DSM-4, it's when the threshold across uh, to the point that you are distressed about it and cause functional impairment, whether in social life or in your private life, okay? All right, this slide uh, just shows um, the 12-month prevalence rate um, as found in NCSR. NCS stands for National Comorbidity Survey Replication. And it's the second nationally represented survey of mental illness in the U.S. that was conducted in the early uh, 2000. The first one was, of course, um, NCS without R, and that was conducted 10 years prior to the replication. It just gives you some idea as the prevalence of various disorders grouped in groups. And you can see the top one is anxiety disorder. And it, so this is the most prevalent mental disorder when all anxiety disorders are considered. 
and it's higher than the mood disorder combined. The mood disorders include such a disorders as depression, major depression, or bipolar disorder. And then impulse control disorder, um, substance followed by substance disorder, and any mental illness. So as, go ahead. You have to cross the threshold. You have to, I have to make sure I stand on camera. Um, <laughs> Please use the mic if you have a question. Sorry. We have people on the web conference. Go ahead. Okay, yeah. You said the, is it a catch all? Or is it? Oh, uh, you have to cross the threshold to meet the criteria. Basically, they have to, okay, so in NCS, uh, they have structured the interview conducted to assess the prevalence rate uh, of illness and uh, uh, correlates of illness. Um, so they have certain criteria you have to meet in order to have the diagnosis, okay? Alrighty, among all anxiety disorders, as you can see, um, again, it's the data from NCSR, the lifetime prevalence of any dis anxiety disorder is about uh, 28, 29, and specific phobia is the one that's most predominant, uh, most prevalent. And specific phobia such as dental phobia, flight phobia, um, cockroach phobia, um, <laughs> Uh, so it's very uh, specific to certain situation or certain object. Um, and we more or less could identify some specophobia in ourselves. However, uh, I am uh, not going to uh, spend too much time on specophobia uh, because in today's talk, why? Because people actually don't often go to treatment. They can live their life around it. Okay, they can avoid it, and their life can still go on as usual most of the time, okay? Now, it's a problem when they have all the cavities and they still don't want to go to the dentist, of <laughs> course. <laughs> um, followed by social anxiety disorder or social phobia, uh, PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder, GAD, generalized anxiety disorder, panic disorder, and OCD. And OCD, of course, uh, as you can see, um, although it's uh, very distressful, the symptoms to the patients, I am not going to spend a lot of time there as well because the, the rate, the lifetime prevalence rate is relatively uh, small. And if you are really interested, you can watch uh, uh, as, good at it, as good as it gets, uh, Jack Nicholson. The movie. <laughs> so, alrighty. Um, there are many challenges um, in ac accurately diagnosing and recognizing anxiety disorder, not only because it can comorbid with very many other psychiatric disorders, such as depression, substance abuse, alcohol abuse is, is a, a very common one, as well as other anxiety disorder. It can also simulate medical conditions such as a thyroid problem, okay? I've seen folks come in uh, with racing heart and, doc, I just can't sit still. I'm so um, anxious, okay? My heart is racing. I'm eating like a horse. I don't gain weight. I said, wait a minute. Well, let's rule out, the, you know, get your thyroid checked out and rule out any medical underlying correctable medical causes before, you know, we move on with other treatment, okay? Uh, again, alcohol and the substance induced, um, cocaine and alcohol prescription medication, um, even SSRIs, which are usually the first line medication treatment for anxiety disorders, can initially uh, cause some anxiety disorders. And sometimes uh, when you're in withdrawal, like if you promptly stop the medication, you can have very bad anxiety symptoms. Antipsychotics, uh, if we have time, I'll talk a little bit more about that, as well as over-the-counter medication, um, such as cold medication or oral medication and caffeine. Okay, here I think it's a 
a, a great time for me to share a little story about uh, my personal experience. Uh, usually, psychiatrists don't do that. <laughs> but since you guys are all my colleagues, I can afford to reveal myself a little bit. Uh, so, a few years ago, um, we moved into our new house, and one of our best friends uh, was uh, uh, so nice and uh, nice enough. She that sent, uh, she ordered, mail ordered a, a huge chocolate cake, and uh, uh, it was beautifully decorated, and it was very rich and just, just you know, yummy like uh, like nothing you've had before. <laughs> So um, I was really indulging myself with uh, two slices of a chocolate for breakfast, uh, the cake uh, in the morning, and uh, you know, um, one slice after dinner as dessert. Okay. A couple of days later, um, I noticed that I start to have this overwhelming sense of anxiety, um, this kind of inner tension. Um, I couldn't sit still, uh, feeling very jittery. Okay. Um, so I start to do some soul searching, what's going on in my life, you know, am I under stress? No, there's no paper due, no grant due, <laughs> deadline, okay, um, no personal conflict with anybody at the time, and uh, um, then I start to look at the things that have changed. That was my diet, okay? I usually don't drink coffee, so now I'm, I'm I'm not dependent on caffeine, but with this three slices of chocolate cake every day, I was injecting a good dose of caffeine into my body that's not used to it, okay? So I said, okay, well, that's my hypothesis. Let me test this. I stopped it. A few days later, I was fine, okay? So that experience taught me tremendously what I need to to know as a psychiatrist, not um, just because, you know, I, I had this experience, and, but also getting a good idea how much people suffer. Actually, when I had that sense of jitter and tension, I really felt I want to shake it off, but I couldn't. It was right with me, and it's, I felt so hopeless almost. You know, I could see if it doesn't get better, I can get very depressed every morning on my way to work and usually it's a nice ride and you know, I enjoy it and it's a rela very uh, relaxing time, do some self-revelation, but instead I was feeling this overwhelm anxiety. So, so when um, you have uh, anxiety, you also want to make sure that you look into your lifestyle. Sleep deprivation is another thing that can cause anxiety as well. Alrighty. Um, Obviously, the disease impact and burden of anxiety disorders uh, can include the dimish, diminished, reduced education and vocational achievement and productivity. And I couldn't concentrate those time, you know. It's very hard for me to, to, be, to function at the level I was previously. Um, impaired relationship, especially in social anxiety disorder, um, People are very anxious about meeting strangers or new people or, or going to social events and um, of course that's going to hurt your relationship um, with others. Depression, of course. Alcohol and substance abuse and a lot of people come in will say, Doc, you know, I have to self-medicate. I said, what kind of stuff you use? Alcohol, drink. Now the thing about the drinking is um, if you just use a little bit, like uh, one glass of wine every night, that's, that's fine. That it's, of course, it's uh, proven to be helpful for your cardiovascular health. Uh, probably it relaxes you as well. And some people will, you know, does not, uh, who don't necessarily enjoy drinking, before they go to social event, they'll have a little glass of wine, just kind of unwind themselves and relax, and that's fine. However, if you start drinking more than uh, just a cup of glass every day, and, and then you have an issue, and it can really backfire on you in terms of uh, getting your anxiety worse. Suicide, and the next slide 
is about the risk of suicide attempts uh, among patients with anxiety disorder, and that's led by PTSD. You can see odds ratio is about six times um, of the normal control, followed by GAD, panic disorder, social disorder, and other anxiety disorder. Just to give you some idea that major depression, the odds ratio is about uh, 10 to 11. Okay, um, this is an overview of treatment of anxiety disorders. Um, we have pharmacological treatments, and SSRI or SNRIs are generally considered as the first line. SSRI stands for Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitor, medications such as what you often hear, Prozac, Zoloft, Lexapro, um, Paxil. Uh, they belong to the SSRI, SSRI group as well as SNRI, which is uh, serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. It's a dual inhibitor. Uh, instead of just blocking the reuptake of serotonin, SNRI block both serotonin as well as norepinephrine. And uh, also, we can't uh, avoid talking about tricyclics or MAOI inhibitors, those are the older generation antidepressants that was used uh, quite a bit in the 50s until probably the 80s when Prozac uh, was first approved. Okay? They carry with more side effects and the risks, especially in overdose. So um, we don't use them as often, but they definitely have a role in treating anxiety disorder as well. Benzodiazepines and I'll spend uh, a little bit more time to talk about this. Uh, so I'll save that. Um, beta blockers, okay, such as propranolol or indolol and atenolol, and uh, uh, they can provide uh, some use uh, in um, stage fright or performance anxiety, use as, as needed. Psychosocial. For folks uh, whose symptoms are not as bad or they want to try something else before they jump onto medication, you could try psychosocial management such as uh, CBT. Uh, that's the most proven effective treatment for anxiety disorder as well as anxiety manage management support and validation. I want to emphasize that support and validation is especially important when you uh, talk to your patients with anxiety disorder or even if you talk to your spouse, family member, neighbors, co-workers, if they have problem with anxiety because one of the issue about anxiety is um, out of the feeling of getting out of control and uh, uh, not being uh, recognized um, uh, for their true feelings uh, the, or the the impact or the the sort of distress that's associated with anxiety. Anxiety usually you can cannot just shake off, okay? So other approaches to anxiety also including you have to know when you need to seek treatment and whether those symptoms are anxiety, are, are suggesting anxiety disorders or not, or not, education of patient and the family, and empowerment. Empowerment is a very powerful tool, okay? Uh, you give patient the control, okay? Uh, in the therapeutic uh, treatment uh, paradigm, you want to um, be patient's advocate. Also, you want to know what they want, okay? Um, because if among all medications uh, of even efficacy, they would like to go with one, not the other, uh, if they can give you a valid reason for it, the compliance rate is higher, okay? If you push something that they don't like, they can always go home and throw in the toilet. And you have no control over that. So you want to give them some control and get them engaged in treatment decision making. And I can't uh, emphasize enough how important that is. Uh, effective SSR treatments uh, include, these are all SSRIs, you know, 
Pyroxene is the generic for Paxil, Sertraline, uh, Fluoxetine, Cytolopram, which is Lexapro, and Cytolopram. That's just a list of the medications. And like I mentioned uh, just a few minutes ago, we also have SNI, and the new addition to that is Duloxetine, or Symbolta. That was um, the latest one that has been approved by FDA for treat, treating generalized anxiety disorder. MAOI, monoamine oxidase inhibitor, and GAB agents, such as clonazepam or clonopin. And benzodiazepines follow into, under this group. Okay, so benzodiazepines are oftentimes, I mean, if one medication in psychiatry that has the most popularity probably is benzodiazepine. And you see that in primary care setting. Uh, you see that being used a lot in primary care setting as well. As soon as if you say, I can't sleep, or I'm stressed out, um, I'm very anxious, the, your family doctor might write just right away write you a prescription for Xanax, which is one of their most favorite medication or clonopin. Okay, the advantage is obvious, okay? Otherwise, people wouldn't still be using this so widely. It's effective, it works right away within 30 minutes, 20 minutes sometimes. <laughs> Rapid onset, like I said. Breakthrough symptoms, you don't have to take it every day and people love it, okay? They don't like the idea I have to take medicine every day. They don't like it. They want to have the control, okay? Yeah, I can take it when I need it. I don't have to take it when I don't need it. And especially when I don't need it, it suggests I'm okay. I'm okay, okay? And uh, it's overall well tolerated, especially in the younger population. And no activation of sexual dysfunction, which is an important plus. And the more effect, seems to be more effective so, for somatic symptoms. And I'll, I'll cover some of the, about the somatic presentation of anxiety disorder as well, um, such as uh, muscle tension, okay, um, butterfly in the stomach. However, Psychiatrists really don't like to use a whole lot of benzodiazepines, okay? If you go to a psychiatrist and say, I'm anxious, I can't sleep, well, the psychiatrist will say, well, let me think about it, okay? If you say, you know, Xanax worked really well for my mom, they go like, maybe not. You know, psychiatrists are a little bit different group of physicians as well, and they, they think more, and they, you know, of course, and from our experience as well, um, this group of medication is not effective for, for comorbid depression, which is oftentimes uh, coexist with anxiety disorder. It causes sedation, okay? They don't want you to take uh, the medication and get on the highway and, uh, and drive to, to fight for driving phobia. Okay, that's not a good idea. <laughs> um, <laughs> Of course, if you stop them, um, especially after an extended period of time of use, you will have a lot of trouble withdrawing. Or, uh, you, a lot of times people just cannot, simply cannot come off that medication. Um, and the most importantly also, uh, they have abuse potential and uh, especially in substance abusers, people who has a history of, uh, you know, uh, alcohol dependence or uh, drug uh, dependence, and uh, you have to screen those out. And if you have to use them, you have to be very cautious and uh, be very upfront uh, to tell them that can be an issue. And uh, if you really want to engage in treatment with me and want to get better, you need to let them me know when you start to use more and more when your body seems to never get enough of that medication or even get high on the medication okay that's a contract you have to set very upfront okay so the goals of treatment include the following you know of course you have uh, you, you want to aim at the core symptoms and the relieve comorbid disorders. That's why SSRIs or SNRI antidepressants uh, are particularly helpful. Uh, achieve remission. 
prevent relapse, improve function and quality, as well as strengthen resilience. And if we have time, I will uh, talk a little bit about resilience um, in uh, PTSD, especially that's especially relevant. Okay. So the human brain is a wonderful thing that operates from the moment you are born until the first time you get up to make a speech. <laughs> Guess what disorder we're talking about here? Okay, of course, social anxiety disorder. Now here we have uh, the top four greatest fears of Fortune 100 CEOs. Okay, number one is speaking in front of others. Can you imagine? See, not all anxiety symptoms are disorders. If you can overcome it, then you're fine. You know, you're a winner. Although these days, I think if they do another survey, this one will jump <laughs> ahead of speaking in front of others, especially for the GM and the four CEOs, good luck with them. Um, okay, and also physicians are no exception, and they did a survey of American College of Cardiology annual meeting. 13% actually took beta blocker. Alrighty, and other, others use diazepam or Valium, and alcohol, alcohol, of course, there's plenty there. Oh. Behavioral techniques, um, deep breathing, okay, muscle relaxation. So social anxiety disorder um, is actually, a, 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 you know, if you think about the social anxiety, it's a spectrum, okay? We all have social anxiety and that's, that can be normal. And people who uh, are shy may have a little bit more problem. Then it's the performance anxiety. It's very localized and quite specific to performance situation, and we call it stage fright. And then generalized, and that's more in uh, most social situations. I'm talking to, um, you, you know, a judge and uh, making public speech or uh, speak during a, a group presentation. And then, of course, uh, on the extreme is avoidant, avoidant personality disorder, and they basically have to live in their own little world. They cannot step out because that causes too much stress, and they would rather not do it, okay? All right, social anxiety disorder. I'll just uh, run this quickly because uh, due to the limitation of time. And marked and persistent fear of social performance situations. Exposure provokes anxiety and sometimes even lead to panic attacks. And fear recognized as excessive or unreasonable. You know it's bad. You know, you know this is too much. You know, well, at least you envy other people who seem like very calm, although you know, you don't know if they took propranolol or Valium <laughs> or had a drink of alcohol or something else before they went on the presentation. And uh, with that, um, these situations are avoided, okay? And you can see, say, if uh, you have a great job opportunity, however, you have to talk to the CEO of the company and you get so anxious and you cancel the interview. And of course, you won't get hired. So obviously, this causes, can cause significant impairment or distress. Very common symptoms of uh, social, or common symptoms of social anxiety include psychological symptoms, sort of the mental anxiety, worries, okay? A feeling of embarrassment, distress, as well as physiological symptoms, which is shown in the next slide, and you stutter, you just, you just can't utter out a word, and a heart pounding so fast, and butterflies, and start to tremble, and shake, and blush, and uh, um, sweating, underarm uh, sweating or forehead are the most common ones, okay? And of course, this doesn't help you, because when you start to feel that way, you go like, ah, people can see that I'm getting so anxious. Oh no, you know, it's like, I am really getting anxious now, they can see now. What actually happens, even if, okay, so when you have those symptoms, you know, a lot of times people don't notice, okay? 
That's reassuring. A lot of times, actually, people don't notice. However, if they notice, what it does is making the other part very anxious as well. Okay? And uh, they don't know what they did wrong. Sometimes they go like, oh gosh, you know, she, you know, she is uh, acting a little strange and is, is something wrong with me? So, um, so that kind of serves a uh, self-fulfilling prophecy to, to get you on a tailspin and sometimes leads to a panic attack. Yeah, I thought there was something on the social anxiety under this. Hit it again. Huh? Oh, hit it again. Oh, okay. Well, two types. Generalized versus. Oh, I was about to have a panic attack. <laughs> generalized versus non generalized. Okay, generalized is in most social situations, non generalized is a stage fright or performance situation. And culture variations. There are a lot of culture variations in terms, of especially this disorder. And the example that I like to use is Taijin Kyofuso, which is a concept in Japanese psychiatry. Taijin Kyofuso simply means phobia of human being, of people. Okay, so it's a Japanese culture-specific syndrome, including four subtypes of phobia: of blushing, okay, deformed body. Uh, eye contact or having foul body odor, um, that is quite different. Um, we, at least in my career as a psychiatrist, I haven't seen that in the population that I have seen. But notice that this is embarrassing to others. Japanese patients with this disorder, they feel like they are presenting as an embarrassment to others. They are making other people very uh, embarrassed. While in Western culture, you feel embarrassed yourself, okay? You recognize your own feeling. While uh, in the Eastern culture, you worry about others. You know, am I making the other party very embarrassed? So, so notice the difference, uh, the culture and uh, ethnic difference. Um, this is a slide to show the educational and occupational impairment. It decreases wage, decreases college education, decreases uh, promotion, uh, professional or management positions or promotions are more significant with people with social anxiety disorder. Pharmacological treatment, again, first line, SSRI, sertraline and peroxidine are FDA approved as well as venlafaxine. As, uh, benzodiazepines does prove uh, use, okay? Does provide uh, some benefits, um, but bear in mind that they carry with a lot of baggages. I'm going to skip some of the slides, but simply this one just shows the efficacy of peroxy in a 12-week trial. They separate from placebo very nicely um, in the first, uh, actually at the two-week point. Again, it not only improves core symptoms, but also decreased disability in social uh, work and family life. And sertraline, that's a, a relapse prevention study that shows sertraline um, reduces people who relapse uh, after the 24 week of, of uh, open label treatment. So the design is everybody gets sertraline for the first part of the study. Whoever responded uh, to sertraline get to go into the second phase of the study where they're randomized to either continue on sertraline or Zoloft or to placebo. And as you can see, the, the group uh, with placebo relapsed significantly higher. And uh, this just shows uh, the benefit of combining SSR with CBT in social anxiety disorder. This provides the best response rate. Beta blockers. Um, the reason I think it's helpful to talk about it is this one can be used as a one-time treatment. If you have to make a presentation, 
you know, um, to have a golf tournament or um, in some kind of performance situation, okay? The usual dose for propranolol is about 10 to 40 a day, or atenolol about 50 to 150. These are used more for kind of a discrete performance anxiety. You want to tell the patient you want to try first, okay, before you take the dose right before your job interview because you never know what kind of reaction you have. So on the weekend, and I advise them on the weekend or in the evening time when you get off work, take a dose, see what it does for you first, okay, because otherwise <laughs> you may regret that. <laughs> Post-traumatic stress disorder. These are uh, some of the core features of PTSD. Of course, trauma is the centerpiece of PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. And uh, there are three clusters of symptoms, including the intrusion and the re-experiencing um, symptoms such as nightmares, flashbacks, can't stop thinking about it, okay? It's like it's stuck with me, I just can't get rid of it. And avoidance, uh, uh, because it's so stuck with you uh, or any little reminder can remind you of the event, you want to stay away as much as possible. The intersection, you had a motor vehicle accident, the place that, you know, you were assaulted. Um, and. Uh, a lot of mood symptoms as well as numbing, withdrawal, and hedonia. My, my concentration is bad. I can't sleep. I can't think. And my mind goes blank all the time. And increased arousal. Uh, wake up middle of the night in cold sweat. And if your coworker just pat you on the shoulder from behind, you jump and as if someone was trying to attack you from your behind. And um, briefly touch on the definition of a trauma uh, in the context of PTSD. Okay, not all stress um, is trauma, okay? In this case, uh, the definition of trauma is uh, an experience that person experienced or witnessed, okay? Uh, or was confronted with an event that involves actual or threatened death or bodily injury um, to Self or others, okay, it doesn't have to be just you. You could be just a bystander. And the response involved intense fear, helpless, or horror. This is uh, a list of examples of traumatic experiences, you know, of course, um, violence, accidents, natural disasters, and other events, even an unexpected death of very close family or your pet animal. PTSD is a worldwide problem. Um, okay. um, as you can see, in areas uh, of the world with mass trauma, the prevalence rate is much higher. Okay? And it has been estimated about 50% of us will experience some sort of trauma that actually qualifies for the trauma definition in PTSD. However, only about a quarter or less people actually eventually develops PTSD. So human beings have a lot of building resilience, okay? So if you have a trauma, accept it because it happened. You don't necessarily, you, you may not, and, and the chance uh, is higher actually if you, that you don't develop PTSD. PTSD, of course, is a very chronic illness, and uh, many people suffer 20 years or more of symptoms and suffering. The average work loss is um, right there, um, about the same as major depression, if not higher. And productivity loss uh, was three billion, of course. And the number of medical visits in the past year PTSD is even higher than major depression, okay? They go to the doctor repeatedly for sometimes very vague complaints and uh, yielded all negative on medical results. Again, first-line treatment, SSRIs, sertraline and paroxetine have been approved by FDA for PTSD, and there are uh, good evidence of Venlafaxine or Effexor, 
as well as a mirtazapine that's in a smaller trial. This just shows the, the uh, acute uh, studies in PTSD and uh, fluoxetine, uh, peroxetine, sertraline, all had proven benefits. Sertraline also has been studied in long-term efficacy. Um, and uh, you can see at three months and nine months, uh, they continue to improve or decrease the symptomatology as time goes on. It also is uh, protective against the relapse. Again, this venlafaxine, and uh, we talk about resiliency, okay? Um, we had a scale, CD risk scale, uh, Connor Davison resilience scale that measures human resiliency. Um, and venlafaxine seemed to be associated with higher score in resilience, it means better resilience. And uh, uh, like I said earlier, resiliency is a very important concept actually in psychiatry, uh, especially in PTSD. Um, as many as half of us um, could and will be exposed to a trauma, but only less than a quarter. Why? You know, um, people want to not only find out what causes the uh, psychopathology, you also want to know what actually um, serve against um, the develop development of uh, psychopathology, you know, what's there to, to protect you from getting ill. Other antidepressants also have been studied. Um, tricyclics actually were among the first to be studied. And Dr. Davison, who is my mentor, um, led uh, some of the most important studies when he was at VA. He recently retired from Duke, but he was the one who um, did the uh, first tricyclic study in PTSD when he was in VA about uh, 20 some years ago. So. All right. And for augmentation, um, prezacine seems to provide benefits as well, along with uh, other adrenergic agents. Anticonvulsants have been studied as well, as well as antipsychotics, especially atypical antipsychotics that have been used more and more beyond their initial FDA-approved indications, which was schizophrenia. These days, you know, they're being approved for bipolar disorder, augmentation treatment of, uh, of uh, depression. So it also um, is a very useful tool, actually, in treating PTSD folks, especially with um, those with psychotic symptoms, hearing things, okay? Hearing gunshots when there's nobody around, and hearing mumbling voices and seeing things, you know? Um, things are crawling, shadows running on the floor, that kind of, um, and it was estimated about 40% of folks with PTSD, sometime in their disease course, they can have psychotic symptoms as well. CBT. The focus of CBT intervention um, is to, prom to try to promote safe confrontations, okay? You want them to, uh, to have some exposure, not avoid those reminders, okay? Um, however, in a very safe environment, okay? Uh, you want to provide some tools that they can use if they're totally stressed out, you know, some relaxation technique, some breathing technique and also aim at uh, modifying the dysfunctional cognitions underlying PTSD. Dr. Zhang, could you um, tell us a little bit about what CBT is? Oh, thank you, Maureen. Uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, okay? So there are two components to it, CBT, okay? C is a cognitive part. You want to do the cognitive restructuring, okay? Um, the world is a dangerous place, and that's a, oftentimes that's a, it's, a, it's a cognitive distortion of people who suffer from PTSD. They've had a bad experience, they think they'll have it again and again and again. Okay, so you want to, to um, there are homeworks and, and, and a lot of times it's a very manual driven uh, 
treatment, the CBT uh, treatment, you want to help them to, to look at the reality. Yes, that happened, that was bad, there's some danger associated with every Day life, but you know, most uh, uh, ninety percent or, or above, uh, you are in a safe environment. You know, so behavioral, of course, uh, you know, techniques such as progressive muscle relaxation. You know, breathing techniques is more of a behavioral approach. All right, this just shows uh, the uh, study design of the. Uh, uh, of combination of drug treatment and PE. PE is actually uh, one of the most important CBT treatment for prolonged exposure, PE. And you can see, especially in partial responders to drug, CBT, or in PE in this case, uh, offered, offered more benefits, okay, in partial responders. All right, I think I'm going to, due to the time concern, I'm going to skip some of the, huh? 30 more minutes, okay, I don't know. Okay, all right, might be able to go over some of those. Um, so um, one of the question that people are most interested in is, okay, so the trauma happened. What can I do to prevent me from developing PTSD, okay? Research study is very limited, okay? Well, one reason is because not everybody's going to go to the doctor after trauma, other than emergency room visit, and psychologically, they may briefly talk to the social worker in the ER, then they get, you know, released to home. So, um, so studies are very limited, uh, and the limited study have not provided any definitive answer. Um, there are studies on uh, tricyclic, antidepressant and mipramine, and a beta blocker. Now the beta blocker was useful to dampen the physiological symptoms, okay? However, it did not prove to, to reduce the rate of PTSD six months later. And benzodiazepines, you're better off not to use them. Why? Because it actually impairs your ability to do cognitive restructuring restructuring, which is an important recovery process for you. All right, so the consensus uh, guideline from uh, the experts of uh, PTSD um, uh, or recommend that uh, immediately after the exposure, you have to normalize the distress, validate the feelings, educate and provide uh, some of the educational materials or website information which I will provide at the end of the study and repeated telling of the event not to avoid it rather you confront it however in a very safe environment okay um, support relieve irrational guilt uh, especially for trauma survivors when there's you know their close family member or their um, close friend died when they, however they survived and they have the survivor guilt. Support group is always helpful. They have su support group for PTSD associated with uh, VA uh, in different parts of North Carolina. Short term sleep medication, okay, for insomnia because uh, you, you have a lot of problems with sleep and Trazodin provides a, a good choice in this situation. Uh, coping strategies, and uh, it's very similar to the previous slide. Male adaptive behavior include, you want to recognize what kind of behaviors are actually not going to help you, okay? Increase of substance use or self-medicate with a lots, lots of alcohol. And avoidance, okay? You know, physical health is important and it's beneficial already. Okay, generalized anxiety disorder um, is another important anxiety disorder. As it's defined as excessive anxiety and worry for more days than, than not. And it's more like a free-floating anxiety. You worry about anything, okay? You don't just worry about social situation. You worry just about anything. Health, money, the stock market, you know, um, and a school performance of my kids, and so it's a free floating. When there's nothing to worry about, guess what they worry? 
Yeah. Something must be wrong because I have nothing to worry about. <laughs> Already? Um, there are associated psychological and physiological symptoms. Psychological symptoms, again, it's more of the kind of mental anxiety, fatigability, concentration problem, my mind going blank. I just can't remember anything, you know? And I was going to the kitchen to, do some, to, to get something. I turned around. When I get to the kitchen, I don't know what I was going to get. And uh, sounds like a little early dementia there. Um, so cognitive impairment, OK? It can be a part of the symptomatology. And physical, physiologically, a lot of muscle tension. The shoulder, back, OK? My uh, masseuse said, you know, in my shoulder is so hard, they're like rocks. And it's hard to, to loosen them up, OK? And sleep disturbance is so common. And um, GAD is considered as a very frustrating disorder in primary care, OK? In that, that uh, the study was done um, in the primary care setting in Puget Sound, and where they um, group patients who are considered by their care provider as a frustrating, OK? Frustrating meaning they repeatedly come in with vague complaints. And you know, you give them this medicine, no, the doctor doesn't work. Next time they come in, it works a little bit, but I just can't take it. It just upsets my stomach. I couldn't sleep. You know, you know I get hot flushes on this medication. And a lot of uh, somatic complaints, OK? And if you do you know, um, EKG and you know, stress test, they are all negative. They just can't pinpoint a cause for that. And while uh, typical patients are just regular patients, you know, with a complaint or f went on, uh, went there for uh, a physical. So uh, there's a, a much higher percentage of prevalence of GAD in this frustrating population. And speaks to the, the utilization, the, the he heavy utilization of health system. And the medical burden, obviously, is very high. And, um, GAD uh, presents with uh, uh, a more uh, uh, high prevalence of these medical illness and uh, more hospitalization or emergency and admissions. GAD is also often, uh, com oftentimes comorbid with other disorders, and about 90% of folks with GAD have a di another psychiatric disorder. You know the of course, the most often ones are major depression followed by alcohol use and other anxiety disorders. OK, so I want to talk a little bit about the differential diagnosis between depression and, and anxiety. Oftentimes, they coexist, OK? It's hard for me to imagine sometimes with that kind of level of anxiety, you can still be smiling all day and feeling happy. And it's just very hard. And I had my personal experience uh, with the chocolate cake. And I, I clearly was not happy. And uh, so depression, of course, is um, more of a mood uh, symptom and decreased mood feeling of worthless and guilt. Uh, so also any suicidal thoughts, of course, it puts you in the category of depression automatically. And uh, GAD, um, you worry, you know, it's more of an anxiety and worry, feeling restless, a lot of somatic symptoms, you know, a here and there, very vague sometimes, and chest pressure, sighing, you know? And uh, of course, in the middle part, you can have them both in depression and anxiety, sleep disturbance, concentration. You know, we have a concept in psychiatry, pseudo dementia, okay? Uh, meaning you just can't remember anything. But uh, w in the case of uh, major depression, however, when depression is treated, their memory can come back. All righty. Uh, differential between GAD, or generalized anxiety, and social anxiety, of course, a GAD is more of a free-floating. It's, it's more of fear of everyday routine, OK? Social anxiety is more of uh, public scrutiny in social situations. PTSD, of course, for GAD, trauma is not the focus. If the trauma is the focus, even, even the symptoms uh, 
res resemble GAD, you have to consider PTSD, okay? And in GAD, sudden startle response is rare, okay? They worry about everything. They kind of just, you know, um, just uh, anxious and sitting on edge all day, but they, they don't get jumpy that easily, okay? Like I have a patient who is a chef, and uh, his trauma was um, uh, in the military, of course, and uh, he gets jumpy. He'll jump to the roof when he works in the kitchen, and the, the, the all the pans and pots drop to the floor. That was uh, just most difficult experience uh, for him being a chef. So PTSD uh, trauma is the centerpiece, okay, as well as this overwhelming startle response upon very minor stimulus, okay? Treatment again, antidepressants are the first line, medication, uh, FDA approved, Lexapro, venlafaxine, Cymbalta, and Paroxetine. Tricyclics, again, uh, has been have been studied. The disadvantage of that is, of course, the cardiotoxicity. And a lot of people also will have anticholinergic effects, and their eyes can't focus, okay, when they read. And, uh, of course, if you overdose, it can kill you. Trazodone, like I said, it's uh, also a very good um, sedative for sleep problems, okay? And then we use it in psychiatry like water <laughs> sometimes because <laughs> we don't want to give benzodiazepines, you know? And trazodone just provides a very good alternative. And there's uh, studies uh, that, that there's uh, proven efficacy, especially in PTSD. Okay, benzodiazepines, we talked about the pros and cons of that, and the benzodiazepines such as Valium, Clonopin seem to work better for psychic anxiety, of this kind of mental anxiety. Um, sorry, somatic anxiety. They work better for muscle tension, you know, and, and the somatic um, symptoms. And you can go back home and read more if you want. <laughs> So this is a, just a comparison of the tricyclic antidepressant imipramine versus benzodiazepine and trazodone. Those was done earlier in '93, and of course they all uh, provided the benefits, and with imipramine superior than the others. Then the faxing also has uh, proven proven efficacy than paroxetine as well. Okay, um, next I want to just spend a few minutes about uh, future research direction and what's uh, needed in future uh, research. We have to, you know, really think beyond SSRIs. Uh, it is the first line medication treatment for just about any anxiety disorder for this decade, okay? It's, it works, it's very safe, However, it carries with it baggages um, that can be sometimes very problematic. GI, okay, and uh, side effects such as nausea is very common in the beginning, okay, although they tend to settle after a couple of days. And then sleep architecture uh, change, and sometimes uh, the sleep actually can be worsened by SSRI, and a lot of people will come in, complain of vivid dreams, okay? My dreams was never this vivid until I get on, you know, so a lot of Paxil. Weight gain is an issue that we all don't like, and uh, sexual side effects. So, um, you know, people will come in and say, Doc, you know, my depression is really bad, but now, uh, my depression was really bad, then I got better after I get on so a lot, but now I'm depressed again because I cannot function in relationship. That makes me very depressed again, all over again, okay? So you have to, so there's a great need for alternatives and uh, or better uh, treatment. Response rate generally is limited less than 30, 70%, so 
not all people will respond to SSRI. Sometimes you have to try a few times, and sometimes they just don't respond to any SSRIs. And the remission rate is even lower, uh, less than one-third of the population getting on SSRI actually get on to symptom-free stage, which is what we really want, you know? So novel agents with improved efficacy and side effects and combination strategies, therapy plus drug or drug plus drug. And special populations, like I said earlier, and um, uh, in children, in women, and during pregnancy, that's always a hard one because you, you can't quite do trials there, but there's a great need for uh, treatment, um, safe and effective treatment during pregnancy, postpartum, you know. Uh, study also, uh, we also need to uh, look at what's protective, you know, what is protecting you from getting, uh, uh, getting sick and naturalistic studies. Okay, those are the, some of the websites that you can get more information on anxiety disorder. And uh, the IPEP website also has Spanish, Chinese, Japanese, and I believe there's Thai translations on the algorithms. Okay, and you can sign on just as a, you know, you don't have to pay money or it's a free uh, accessible website and, and you can take a look of the algorithm. Meaning, what are the first step? And if you still have these these symptoms, what do you go next? Okay, it's very educational. <coughs> Questions? Yeah. When it comes to side effects of SSRIs, is there any difference in presentation between males and females? I have not seen a whole lot of difference in terms of uh, 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 definitive trend, okay? Female can also, I've, I have a lot of female patients come in that will, they, they complain of sexual side effects as well. And uh, I have uh, given um, Viagra uh, and sometimes Wellbutrin for sexual side effects, um, but Viagra does not seem to work in uh, female population. So I have not seen a, a lot of difference. Hi. Um, is there any kind of group or movement that's trying to advance uh, having massage or gymnasium mm -hmm. memberships or yoga classes uh, reimbursed by medical insurance since they do seem to be so effective in relieving symptoms? That's a good question. I'm not sure. I think there's a great need for that and it really works beautifully well for a certain population of patients and some people will just come back soon. You know, I, I feel so much better just with these alone and those are costly. However, um, of course, carry much less side effects. <laughs> The side effects is cost. <laughs> I worked on all the Lexapro studies and we didn't see any difference between men and women because I worked for Forrest who produces yeah. Lexapro yeah. Yeah. and we saw no differences in sex yeah. in terms of side effects. Yeah. Thank you. If a person um, becomes well or uh, asymptomatic with general anxiety disorder or depression, is there ever a point where they can stop the SSRI? What we say is, um, it's especially for depression, okay? What we say is, um, if you've had one episode of major depression or major depressive disorder, your chance of relapse is about 50%, 50%, okay? When you have had two, it's about 75. After three episodes, your chance of re relapse is, is much higher to about 90%, okay? Um, so you want to have a thorough discussion with the patient or if you are the patient with your physician, you know, what are the risks and what are the benefits, okay? And some people decide, you know, I'm not going to take that risk because it's just too much. And plus, medication 
doesn't work right away. SSRIs takes a couple of weeks and sometimes um, months for it to, to work in slow responders. I do not want to put up with even one more week of that feeling, okay? Um, so the general recommendation is if you uh, went into remission, we want you to continue the medication for a year before you consider maybe coming off the medication. But um, I think it's also a great idea to um, learn some good CBT skills. So when you come off medication, you still have some crutch that you can rely on that's not medication, you know, and uh, um, uh, you can use some of the CBT skills uh, if you have, uh, you know, some, some symptoms that relapse again after you come off the medication. So that's what I tell them. If you want to take the 90% the chance of relapse, you can. You can. And plus, if you say you can't, they still go home and stop it. So <laughs> a lot of times, yeah. Do you have any information about the use of antidepressants on people who have dysthymia or depressive personality disorder patterns and things of that nature and how that works, if it works yeah, at all? Yeah, there's plenty uh, evidence there. And that's what we use. Although uh, people with just dysthymia, which is a low grade of depression, that kind of persist longer than two years, okay? They don't necessarily feel suicidal or hopeless, but they are just a not happy camper, you know? They look miserable. And, and SSRIs are, are the first line treatment for that. And there's evidence for that too. Is there a genetic relationship um, yes. if your parents experience? Yes, okay. there's plenty of studies of <laughs> genetic linkage study, yes, yes. Um, they can and they do run in family. And, uh, uh, you know, f uh, when we evaluate a patient, the one of the uh, must-ask question is, does it run in the family, okay? Uh, uh, who is it in the family? Okay, or your mother. Okay, so is she on any medication? Yes, yes, she tried a bunch of medication, but finally she settled on Lexapro that has worked very well for her. Then that kind of, you kind of uh, give, it gives you some clue as to what you want to start the patient on. Okay, one is because of the genetic uh, component and the drug response is also proven to be genetic, genetic related. Uh, also, people seem to have more faith if they've seen some medication that worked for their family members. So, yeah, that's a great medication. Well, of course, you know, it doesn't work all the time. And uh, sometimes they can, you know, my best friend is uh, taking this, I just, I just have to get on this medication. <laughs> okay, I think it works wonder, you know, you know. So I said, okay, well, we can give it a try, but there's no guarantee, really, there's no guarantee. Do you want to talk about the placebo effect in clinical trials for psychiatry? Well, one of the slides um, in GAD uh, where they compare, I think they compare imipramine, trazodone, and uh, one of the benzodiazepines, uh, there's a placebo response, okay? And placebo response is a, really a real response, especially in psychiatry. Coming to the doctor's office is therapeutic itself, okay? And, uh, and even if you don't say any word, and if, if, if you have a very good relationship, they just sit in the couch and they, they are a lot better. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> placebo response, use placebo response to your advantage. <laughs> yeah. Uh, is chronic fatigue syndrome always associated with uh, anxiety? Disorder? Yes. Um, chronic fatigue syndrome, um, uh, there's a higher rate of anxiety disorder among people with uh, chronic fatigue syndrome, um, vice versa. So, uh, you know, why? I'm, I'm not sure, but um, it just makes sense to me. If you are tired all the time, you get overwhelmed easily by your job tasks or by your responsibilities. And then, you know, set you, uh, just trigger off anxiety. Anxiety is the sense of things are getting out of control. So your ability can't quite match what you want to achieve. 
the gap creates anxiety. So yeah, it, it's 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 very often, oftentimes yeah, uh, you you see depression and you see anxiety, chronically fatigue syndrome, um, fibromyalgia, also many of the chronic illness. Thank you. Well, okay, well, I just wanted to, um, for everyone to um, uh, say thank you to Dr. Zong. It's great to have her. Thank you. I hope that that's, uh, um, that's uh, helpful. <laughs>